parliamentary democracy is facing today threats and challenges worldwide and sometimes within the EU in certain member states. So we thought that the European Parliament uh, that is championing parliamentary democracy and especially new forms of uh, parliamentary democracy uh, should uh, address this issue. Indeed, uh, the, uh, the defense, the championing of democracy is one of its main uh, objectives. And uh, therefore, I thought uh, we might discuss this issue today and I go straight into the subject. Uh, democratic decision making is often criticized that it's less effective than authoritarian rule, is it? Oh, that's a difficult question if you are here in Greece, and as I had the honor to read the Politeia in ancient Greek <laughs> and try to understand uh, what uh, Plato uh, was mentioning, I think um, if you speak about effectiveness, democracy may be a little bit lazy, but if you speak about doing what politics should do, as Plato has described in Politeia or uh, Cicero has described in the Republica, that uh, you have to find a balance of interests. Therefore, I think democracy is the best one because uh, it really takes care from the input side, uh -huh. what are all the interests, but on, as well on the output side, who is benefiting at the end of the day. And if you compare to all the other five systems which you, we know since Plato and, 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 and Cicero, I have not the feeling that the others uh, uh, deliver better. Uh, if you look to China, to mention only one, which I don't call democracy and I wouldn't call it, of course, they have easy processes to decide. But on the other hand, if you look about corruption and things like that, and uh, if party is not reorganizing itself, nothing comes to the public, uh, it's a huge problem and the output is more in the interest of those who are governing than in the interest of the people. And, and I, therefore, I think democracy is still the best one. Actually, they say that other democratic, uh, truly democratic uh, uh, countries, or, uh, such as the United States, are supposed to have a more effective uh, rule, uh, decision making, than the EU democracy. What do you think? Again, it's like Marco said, uh, depending on who you would, who you would do you wish to benefit and who do you uh, think that's more effective for. Um, uh, I think that the European model is far more effective in the issues of social uh, welfare, of, uh, of equality, and uh, definitely uh, I can see problems in the, in the American system in, in issues of, uh, of systemic racism, in the issues of, uh, of uh, social and economic inequality, which has been uh, rising exponentially in the past 30 years. Uh, and unfortunately, we have also seen uh, in the past mandate at least, and sa sadly still, uh, an extreme polarization of the American political scene, where it's really difficult to get things done, it seems, in the Congress and in the Senate lately, especially if we look at the um, uh, one-person uh, democratic stop of, uh, of, of uh, Senator Manchin stopping the whole uh, American Green Deal, not stopping, but, you know, putting a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, uh, objects uh, yeah, against it. Um, so, uh, yes, we have to learn from one another, and what I think is for sure that is uh, that democracy should share uh, best practices, and uh, definitely we can learn a lot from their model of, uh, of a federal system, which is something that uh, I think we should, be, we should be looking forward in the European Union at a more, a more federal uh, government. Marcos, what do you think? If I come from my area, which I'm working on in the European Parliament, which is financial markets regulation and stuff like that, and I discuss that with senators, even with senators, they have no clue. Because if you ask them about accountability, which I think is very important in, in a democratic system as well, they say, oh, it's not us to decide. We gave, we empowered agencies yes. to solve the problems. And we do it by, via legislation, so maybe they do it faster, because if you transfer it to agency, they can put rules very quickly. But we have a process where, of course, we take note of all the interests on the input side, as I said, and we take care on the output side as well. Did we deliver what we asked for, or do we have to rechange? And, and if you put that to the accountability issue, then I think our system may be a little bit slower, but at the end, uh, if a bank is asking me, I know what we have decided. If a bank is asking a senator, they don't know what will happen because that is done by agencies. And then I think a democratic system 
means for me that those who have been elected by the people take the responsibility for the decisions, and that's why I prefer our system in comparison to the United States. I have a more, uh, let's widen the picture a little bit, Petros. Increasingly, the challenges facing our citizens require global governance solutions, like climate change, pandemics, geostrategic challenges uh, that relate to revisionism, like uh, the, uh, the situation now in Ukraine. And the multilateral institutions that we have are demonstrably unable to undertake effectively this task. So uh, how, how can we build a global governance that is democratic? Well, we have been trying for a couple of centuries now to do that. And uh, since we now have 200 years from the Greek Revolution, this was also a project in that sense of uh, creating uh, a global commons. Uh, we're not there yet, but I wouldn't lose my faith in the multilateral uh, global governance mechanisms. They are delivering in many ways. We should listen to them more as we've entered into this uh, era of precarity and. Uh, and uh, fragility, if you wish, uh, after the end of the end of history. Uh, I think that the example of the World uh, Health Organization uh, during the pandemic is critical. And I think that uh, we do have a tremendous opportunity now with uh, the Paris Agreement, which is a global agreement, and uh, it has been resurrected in many ways in Glasgow, and also its twin document, which is the political program that accompanies uh, the uh, Paris Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals, which remain the first uh, uh, politically agreed universal language which we share across across all the 193 countries that have signed it, and for the first time provide us a common language with goals for governments, subnational governments, businesses, uh, NGOs, and everyone, even households, with uh, measurable and deliverable uh, policy goals. So I think it's very crucial that we uh, take this model under, uh, we use it. Uh, we're doing efforts now in the European Union in, by uh, inserting it in the European semester mechanism. Uh, and I think it's crucial that this, in, in this decade of, of tremendous change, we act on evidence-based policy and we can prove or disprove we can need to be accountable to our uh, to the citizens, and uh, you know, numbers is a good way to be accountable, not only in economics, but also in uh, across the 17 groups. But let me c c come with a follow-up question on this one. As the scope of the nation state is obviously inadequate in this context of global governance, <laughs> is, defi is defending European values in the quest for solutions of global governance a new mission for the European Union? I mean. In the 20th century, the European Union has been successful in uh, being a profitable, mutually profitable uh, 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 partnership, so to say. But now we're facing the big picture. Is it the European Union the vehicle to lead us in this uh, global discussion? I would say absolutely yes, in the sense that the European Union uh, embodies the, the, the fundamental European value, values and the value of fundamental rights and the idea of the rule of law. And I think that uh, as we move to this uh, multipolar world where Europe wants to uh, have an identity and move on this identity, I think that this is what we bring on the table. This is where these uh, ideas of uh, representative democracy, of uh, the, the liberal state have originated, and uh, I think it is our job to do it. Marcos, speaking yeah. of values, <laughs> what are the values that are necessary for a democracy to work? I mean, it's, it's a big issue. Yeah, of course, rule of law, which was mentioned, I think is yeah. one of the key elements that we trust, and we even trust what's happening at courts, and, and we accept uh, court decisions, for example, we accept democratic decisions, and all this stuff. But in our time, I think, additionally, accountability, which I mentioned already, I think is very important, openness, and transparency. I think our HR demands for more transparency in the decision-taking process is to do that publicly, not in closed doors, as the Council unfortunately does in the European Union. Um, the Parliament is really open. Everyone can follow what we are doing, who is doing what. The other thing is, of course, openness, that everyone has the uh, possibility to take influence. But on the other hand, we have to be aware, I see in a lot of member states, more and more parties who are single issue or two issue parties. And with them to compromise, which I think in democracy is one of the key elements. At the end, you need a compromise. 
we know it best because in the European Parliament, if you are not able to compromise, you are a standalone MEP and have no influence. Yeah, that's how it works. It's very easy to understand. It's only to mention my party. We are six members in the European Parliament out of 705. That is far away from a majority. So you have to build bridges and compromise. But as more as we have these one or two issue parties, as less we have the chance uh, uh, to achieve this compromise. And that is really something which is concerning me. And uh, uh, the last thing, accountability, even that is an issue. If you look, for example, sorry for the state I know best, which is Germany. Maybe you hear a little bit my German accent. Um, in the COVID situation, all politicians stick to what experts said. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's different because the uh, legitimation comes from the elections and for the government at the end of a government building process and not for experts. Experts are necessary, but you can't transfer all responsibility to them. And therefore, accountability, I think, is something which we have to take more into account that those who decide take responsibility for their decisions. I'll come both to, to both of you in a, for a difficult question, I think. Uh, there are a lot of, it's quite open. In the 20th century, day, you delivered uh, an attractive package, peace, democracy, and prosperity as a total. With the ongoing globalization and the technological change, a lot of this package is unraveling. So my question is, this economic changes, how do they impact on the content of democracy? I mean, in, in, the, in the world we have in front of us, does democracy need to adjust in order to go hand in hand with the evolving economy? Marcus. Ah, honestly, I think European Union still has a good sex appeal. Mm -hmm. And after the 24th of February, peace is something which is newly in the center of the discussions. So I grew up where I thought there will be no war anymore in Europe. There will be war somewhere, but not in Europe. And then even as a young boy, I saw what happened when Yugoslavia broke down with all these horrible pictures. And then we decided again and said, and that was already the time I joined European Parliament, never again on this continent. And what we see since 24th of February shows that peace is nothing which has le uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, for itself in Europe, we have to work for that and we have to work differently than we did maybe in the last 30 years. So peace is a value which makes still the attractiveness for mm -hmm. Europe. The same goes as well for democracy. If you look to the states represented in the United Nations, less and less are democratic states. Mm -hmm. And that is really something concerning me because uh, maybe we've been blunt to think that our system is the best one as we are used to it. Uh, and you have invented it here a long time ago. <laughs> but honestly, as we spoke, all the questions you put, I think, showed that in comparison to all other uh, systems, uh, uh, democracy at the end delivers best results for the citizens, for the environment, for the social balance and all the stuff which is the demand from the citizens and thirdly, of course, prosperity was one of the promises of European Union. Prosperity was delivered, is delivered and will be delivered. And I think uh, if you look what we did with the RRF, for example, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, where we really said we have a common uh, challenge and as Europeans we answer this challenge in a common way, I think it's a huge step forward to fulfill this uh, promise of prosperity. Petros, will the new type of economy impact on democracy? Absolutely. I think that uh, the economic condition is a prerequisite for democracy and also for peace. And I think that uh, since uh, uh, we declared the end of history in, uh, 18, uh, in 1989, mm -hmm. uh, we have now arrived at the point where uh, we should think again of what we managed to deliver. We believe that uh, uh, the, you know, the, f the opening of the markets, the free market, will drive everybody towards democracy. But this, like Marcus said, has not happened. Uh, not only across the world is democracy, unfortunately, retreating in general in the past few years, uh, but uh, we have m also have allowed the non-democratic situation to uh, be uh, dominant next to our border and, uh, and, and invading, actually, Europe right now. 
Uh, we also have such problems with the rule of law uh, within uh, our uh, European Union, with uh, Poland, with Hungary, and generally in the, in the Balkans. So uh, I think that it's really time to rethink the economic model. And uh, I would like to also include to the idea of accountability, of polit political accountability versus the experts' accountability, also uh, the financial experts, which have uh, uh, pretty much ruled in the past 30 years. And you know, I think we will agree that economy is a much less exact science than uh, medicine or, uh, or, or the climate science, which I would still stick to the experts a little <laughs> bit and need to follow the science, which, you know, hopefully will include economics in the future. Um, now, on the accountability on the RRF, I have to agree it's a, a fantastic opportunity. Uh, but uh, I have to say that at least in, uh, we have to make sure of the implementation, because now, as we uh, uh, cross that Rubicon of having, uh, let's say, central, uh, federal revenues with their own resources, we have the onus of accountability. We have to uh, have oversight, and we do have parliamentary oversight over the RRF, but not in this country. In this country, we don't have uh, an agreement on a parliamentary um, uh, committee to inquire on the RRF, and we did not have a very good uh, uh, experience with a public consultation, neither in the RRF, nor in the Just Transition Fund, nor in the uh, National Plan for the, uh, for the Common Agricultural Policy. And I think that uh, the inclusion of the public in the, uh, in the design is necessary for the delivery and for the uh, establishment of the feeling of justice, which is necessary to, to keep the population on the side of democracy. We have a very strong undercurrent uh, going on also in Europe with uh, anti-science, anti-vax, anti-elite, anti-system. And we need to be very, very careful as we move in headlong and as we should into this uh, green transition that uh, we make sure that we leave no one behind. That means that we include everybody from the design, from the get-go, uh, and uh, that's, that's the only way we can have this transition be effective if it's just. Let me take an example on what we're talking. Do uh, the new global tech giants constitute a challenge, a threat to democracy? Honestly, and we have, we have approval on that. <laughs> Come on, we have approval of that. If you look what happened with uh, the referendum in the United Kingdom, there was a lot of influence coming via social media uh, to vote for the leave and not for the remain. If you look what happened around the, you mentioned the former US president, mm -hmm. what happened around uh, the US elections. And even we saw in the European elections in 2019 a lot of attacks, but we've been better prepared. So I spoke with those tech giants, what they have implemented. On the other hand, we learned our lesson as well. Commission made proposals on the DMA we have already agreed on in, in the trilogue, the Digital Markets Act, uh, the DSA is under negotiations, and I hope we can finalize it very quickly. Um, we are trying to establish a European approach because that is really necessary. You can't do that in subsidiarity, and uh -huh. Denmark does it that way, Greece that way, Nor uh, Norway is not in the EU, but uh, Poland a different way, Hungary the Hungarian way, then we are lost. Yeah. <laughs> so the Hungarian way is not the prototype, Especially the Hungarian. Not the prototype for, for, for yeah. Europe. You understand what I meant? And therefore we need I'll come Europe back to that. European it's very institutions, but that means that member states are willing to accept um, that Europe takes the lead in this issue mm -hmm. and not anymore the member states. And on the other hand, we have to be aware, I don't think that this format is very attractive for TikTok users. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to be aware as well how we present ourselves, how we are able to have access to those people who do not watch news in, on TV in the evening, but only Netflix, who do not listen to radio, but uh, to their small world on Facebook, TikTok, wherever, where they have their echo rooms, and therefore it's really a threat. And the algorithms are programmed in a way that the most noisy one is the most broadened. So if you are boring, like politicians traditionally are, because especially when you are on a democratic ground, where you are balanced, where you try to take a lot of things into account, then you are boring. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You Complexity are, is you boring. Are, you are, you know, it, 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 yeah, you, a you, simplistic you, answer is complex. If I say all of you are crazy yeah. and, and uh, I'm the only one who knows the real truth, then I 
uh, give, get better results in the algorithms yes. than when I explain how the algorithms work. Yes. And, and that is the problem, and that is where really the, the, the big techs have to be aware of, yeah. because they can only survive in a democratic system. They will not survive in a system, even Erdogan for some time switched off uh, <laughs> uh, Facebook. In China, they try to create their own systems to have state control via these social networks. So if you really want to have an open society, then you have to take care that your algorithms do not deliver the opposite. And that is the main threat behind the scenes. What do you think, Petros? Are they a threat to us? Look, uh, I think that this is again a situation where uh, the initial idea that the, um, the internet would be a huge public agora, and going back to, uh, to Politia and Plato, I mean, the idea that we have uh, deregulated and privatized the rules of, uh, of democratic engagement um, has uh, shown that this uh, creates uh, serious threats. Uh, and uh, even before, sometimes they shut it down, but sometimes they use it to very uh, effective non-democratic uh, ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think it's clear we need to regulate this, uh, this space to make sure that it follows what we believe are the rules of democracy. Like uh, we said before, our job in the European Parliament is to deliver compromises, but we do that in a very structured way of dialogue with committees, shadows, and it doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. I mean, yeah. it, it takes, it takes uh, let's say, a method. I take the opportunity of the Conference for the Future of Europe uh, that has been launched, that is near completion, and we'll see what sort of results we will have. And uh, the citizens have been directly asked, how can we reform our democracies, among other things? And this is a thorny issue. And there is a general question hanging in the air whether we need to incorporate to our democracies new modes of citizens' participation. What do you think of that? Do we? Do we need something new? We definitely always need something new. Democracy is a living, uh, is a living organism. It depends mm -hmm. on, on participation. And as the means of participation change, uh, we, need to go th uh, we need to go with the times. And uh, we need to make sure that we, uh, we ensure that there is a democratic way to, to engage in TikTok or in other ways. Um, so uh, yes, absolutely, we need to. And I think that the form of uh, the future of, uh, of democracy of, uh, of the European Union is, uh, is a very important experiment. But uh, I think we need uh, to be bold, to be way bolder, and um, uh, promote uh, much greater European integration to have European-wide uh, systems of participation that European citizens feel that they participate in the European democracy. We, members of the European Far Parliament, sometimes um, feel detached or feel isolated from what is happening in our electorates. Uh, so we need to create a, a common European democratic space, a common European electorate, and a common European uh, uh, system of, of democracy. Any specific proposals? Any specific proposals? Well, there's a ton of them in the future of uh, Europe uh, suggestions by the citizens, and most of them are extremely interesting. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, ha going after uh, doing this for the first time since Lisbon, I think it's time that we, be, we look boldly and we, we make changes. Marcos, what do you think? Honestly, I think the problem is even more complex. Mm -hmm. Because in the European elections every five years, what are you voting for? You are voting for your representatives from your member state. But do you really vote for a political concept? In parallel, what you do in national elections, for example, where, of course, yeah. series I had another concept than the other democracia, only to mention the, the Greek example. That means for me, um, on the European elections, it's not are you in favor or against Europe. It's a question of, should be the same question, what kind of Europe yes. do you want and which party preference, therefore, would be necessary. That means, of course, that we have to have more European approach, more mm -hmm. visible European parties, which uh, uh, gives the impression, yes, that is linked to really a decision process. Number two is, of course, this failed Spitzenkandidaten process. Exactly, I wanted to ask you this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that you have I to mean, ask me as yes, Manfred Weber comes from my party. Why was it defeated? Yeah, he was defeated in the, no, 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 in the parliament no, 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 no. and in the council. Sorry. The, the concept. The, the concept. Yeah, but Why the do concept the failed concept? because the head of state still think they have the power. Mm -hmm. 
and, and they, they can decide in, behind closed doors whatever they want. Five years ago, the thing with Jean-Claude Juncker worked only for one reason, because Martin Schulz and Jean-Claude Juncker made an agreement. Yeah. Whatever happens, we stick together before the elections. That failed in this time. There was no agreement between Vestager, Timmermans, and Weber, which I think was not Weber's problem. But that's, as I said, Parliament created a problem as well. If the Parliament would have sticked together, mm. we want only the one who won. Uh, then I think the council would have moved, but as the parliament was not united, the council was able to decide whatever they want. Then, of what course, is your you can vote, for the then you can, of, of course, ask the question why the hell did the parliament vote for Ms. von der Leyen? <laughs> uh, it happened, don't ask me why. Uh, it happened, and, and that's it. For 24, I think we have to rethink whether this process is the right one, and secondly, whether we can really establish more uh, a European party system that you know, it's not only, I take my family, mm -hmm. Nea Demokratia, it's European People's Parties and Spitzenkandidat, whoever. And the same for the left and for the socialists and Democrats and for all the others. And then I think people have more the feeling that they are decisive in their vote mm -hmm. uh, about the outcome and the political content for the next five years for the moment. It's the council, it's of course the parliament, but n no one sees what, what is changing uh, if I vote this, this, or that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that is a real democratic problem, um, which you have on local level, on regional level, on national level, sure. you know what you get. Yeah. On European level, you get something that Europe continues. That's not enough, and is not attractive for the electorate. Petros, I keep hearing uh, people, they say, Europe, as if Europe has a single uh, personality. Whereas uh, when you come closer to the European Parliament, you see that it is a, you know, a multi-party system, it's a true democracy, there are uh, clashes, there are differences of opinion, and as Marcus correctly says, there, there, is, there is a reason to, to, to have more active uh, political identity in the European parties. How can we achieve that? How can we transfer from national parties to a European party in a way that impacts on the citizen? That he feels that he belongs also to the left, for example. Not only Syriza, to the left. Well, I think that this uh, road uh, goes through more part of the parliament. I think that in the process of... European, European parliament. European parliament, yeah. yes. Uh, I think that in the process of European unification in the past 40, 50 years, mm. uh, the, uh, the power of the parliament has been growing. It needs to grow more, but uh, for this to happen, there needs to be some sort of a European constitution or, or, or European... Um, a constitution. I mean, it's strange to go into a parliament and um, not not give an oath to something, not uh, uh, declare your allegiance to something except a nice symphonic music. So um, I think that the European Parliament is the space where, which can really um, bring forward the European values of transparency, of openness, of the means to compromise, uh, and uh, moving forward in a, in a prosperous and, and peaceful way. And the future of democracy to close with this. The future of democracy is the youth. The youth is not apolitical, as we often say. They have a political notion, but they do not participate in the institutions of representative democracy. Why and how can we remedy this? I mean, it's essential if democracy has a future, is to have a future. Yeah, that's a very important question, and I'm very happy that you put it at the end of this very in important discussion because participation is key mm -hmm. but as I said more than once accountability especially in the European decision process at the end something has been decided by an anonymous structure at the end Europe Europe and especially sorry uh, the member states are the problem normally not the European Parliament because um, in a normal, well, in fact, are not Europe. No, in a normal democratic system, check and balances works quite well. But in Europe, we make it so complicated mm. that at the end, something happens for the people, and no one was responsible. And uh, because after 50 checks and balances, you really lost track. <laughs> 
who, who made it. And then, of course, you cannot enforce young people to say, yeah, that's what I'm fighting for. But on the other hand, uh, if you look to parts of Europe after the referendum in the United Kingdom, it was the young people who stood up. I, we don't want that our Europe will be destroyed by the old ones, by the way. Yeah, and, and that was really interesting for me to see that on Sunday afternoon, young people stood up in every city saying, we want to have Europe for climate change. Though there are, of course, issues where you can attract young people uh -huh. to engage. But then, sorry that I blame now the Greens, but if I look what happens in my government in Germany, if you are in opposition, it's easy to say whatever you want. <laughs> now they are responsible, and they have to take decisions and explain it, especially to the youth, and they got a lot of support from the young electorate. But that helps that politics starts with the uh, reality, taking care of the reality, and that means, of course, you have to find compromises, you have to change your opinion if the world changes, and the 24th of February is a huge change of the world, uh -huh. so you have to adapt your policies in a lot of areas, um, and, but that has to be translated to the young generation, <laughs> that they understand it and, and, and try to take influence as well, although their main issues may be not the top priority for the moment, uh, that those things don't get lost. But every generation has to be reintroduced to a democratic system. It's not automatically that all men and all women are in favor of democracy. Honestly, that is something what we always have to do, we always have to deliver for. And as I'm the president of Hans Seidel Foundation, a political affiliated uh, 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 foundation, that is one of our key elements, <laughs> to take care that every generation adapts what democracy means for the actual time and how to engage in that. Petros, why, are we, why do the young do not like us anymore as uh, Melina Margot? Well, let's start from uh, accepting that this is our problem and not uh, the, the youth's problem. Exactly. Except we are not doing something right. And I think that uh, the, one of the best allures of democracy is the joy of participation. So we need to make yeah. this more accessible, more joyful, more meaningful. Now, we have um, two, 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 let's say, facts. One is that we have a generation which was born European mm -hmm. and understands Europe as, as a united space, which was not the case in, in our parents. And um, we also have a generation which is born native user of, uh, of the tech, uh, of the new technology and social media. Um, and also we have a generation which is facing an existential threat, because an, an existential threat that cannot be dealt with in a, in a nation state system. In a, in a member state system. And I'm referring to the climate crisis, which to the youth looks horrifying. I mean, we look at the numbers and they point to 2030, they used to point to 2050. Now in 2050, I will frankly be too old to care. But if I was born, uh, if I was now 20 years old, exactly. I would care very much. So the example of Brexit is a good example. I think this generation uh, will engage more with these issues because they understand that the European Union is uh, is their home, and they understand that they need to be doing something. Yeah, but you, to, you, you said about the Brexit. Mm -hmm. The youth in the UK, they were pro-Remain. Yes. But they didn't go to vote on that uh, damn Thursday. It was a good education lesson, yes. Sorry. Did they get the Sorry for being so cynical, but democracy means as yeah, well, I don't have to participate. But then I have to respect what those who participate in the in next decided. elections that actually the uh, parliamentary elections that actually verified the referendum, they still didn't go to vote. So I mean, we have a problem. Democracy means participation as well, and if you abstain from participation, yeah, exactly. you cannot blame those who participated. Well, I think that, uh, and allow me to do so, but I think that in our country we have a tremendous opportunity to move uh, to, war, to remedy one of the main uh, misgivings of our post the junta post dictatorship political system, which for the first time we have uh, voting on, uh, on, the, on the simple majority, on proportionality. Mm -hmm. Up to now we had this uh, system which really gave uh, um, a bonus to the first party in the idea that the political system is not mature enough to reach compromises, to work together, and that the ruling party would need uh, some sort of a, of a crowd, which is really not 
democratic if you get so many more seats. Um, so uh, I think that this coming of age of the Greek democracy is a very important step in the next elections whenever they come, so that we, we finally come up with a system where we are obliged to do what we do in the European Parliament. We don't have that here in, in, uh, in Greece, and, and a Greek political world which is important and definitely not present in Politia is after the Namia, which means own power. I'm, I'm aut autonomous, which means that I don't need to cooperate with anybody else because I am. Uh, I am. So, so you are optimistic enough to be I, convinced that our system. I is have a true. problem with seeing how we are going to face this uh, this crisis, this 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 repeating crisis, which have been uh, coming up from the fragility of our system, their economic crisis, their uh, quality crisis, uh, health crisis, yeah. uh, climate crisis, uh, with, uh, with a party which rules with now maybe 35%, which is 35% of the 50% who actually go to vote, which is really not um, the way that we can achieve this broad majorities, this, this broad participation mm -hmm. that we need to, to, going back to the leave no one behind idea, we need to reach out to people more. Thank you very much. Indeed, it was a very big subject and a very thorny subject, and uh, your very immediate questions, I think they shed some light. There is no conclusion in such a difficult discussion, but we're making our best to build, uh, you know, a better comprehension of this uh, evolving issue. Thank you so much. Thank you.